Welcome back to the playlist on ethanol. In the previous video, we looked at one of the metabolic routes for this molecule right here. This is the molecule ethanol. And we saw that ethanol could be oxidized into this molecule over here, which is referred to as acetaldehyde. And the enzyme that we looked at doing that was referred to as just simple alcohol dehydrogenase. And one of the alcohol dehydrogenases can convert ethanol into acetaldehyde. It's going to take the alcohol group on this and convert it into an aldehyde. And some of the alcohol dehydrogenases can work on other alcohols as well, not just ethanol. Um, however, ethanol can also be oxidized into acetaldehyde through a completely a different mechanism and, as a result, a completely different enzyme. The enzyme we're going to look at in this video is one of the cytochrome P450 enzymes. Uh, cytochrome P450, in terms of the genes, is the largest gene superfamily in humans and all mammals for the most part. Um, whenever you're talking about a cytochrome P450 enzyme, there's a typical way that you denote them. You always put this CYP, and CYP refers to the gene uh, superfamily, and then there's always a, a numerical slash uh, letter a designation that represents which one of these P450 enzymes you're talking about. For example, the uh, one that people normally talk about first in a book, just because it's numerically first, is CYP1A1. That's a different P450 than CYP2E1. And it turns out that the P450 enzyme, the particular one that metabolizes ethanol, is CYP2E1. And we're going to look at this particular P450's alcohol oxidizing activity that generates acetaldehyde. Now, one th very common motif in biochemistry, and we're usually concerned about humans when we do this, is that any time you have a molecule, doesn't matter what it is, in fact, there's a, an enormous variety of these things, anytime you have a molecule that the body would possibly perceive as foreign or toxic, and we're, of course, not talking about proteins here, very large molecules. We're talking about things that you could potentially memorize and draw in your biochemistry course, right? These molecules are perceived as toxic, foreign, and a good rule of thumb is that every one of these, just about, I can't think of any exceptions, they're all metabolized by one of the P450 enzymes. So, for example, if you take some kind of medication, say, a beta blocker, take a beta blocker, you could take a psychiatric medication, whatever the medication is in general, one of the P450s or more than one of them are going to get a hold of it. And then there's also some auxiliary enzymes that go with those that further process them. So one thing, one uh, sort of way you can look at the P450s is one of the things they do is they help detoxify foreign and therefore toxic compounds because the body doesn't tolerate foreign compounds, and certainly doesn't do that with toxic ones either. Another rule of thumb on the opposite end of the scope is that if you have a molecule that is not foreign, for example, glutamate, an amino acid, um, I'd be pretty comfortable saying that humans can tolerate quite a bit of glutamate. Well, therefore, you wouldn't really expect a common molecule like that to be metabolized significantly by these enzymes. And there are exceptions to this. But in general, other than steroids and certain eicosanoids, um, every other molecule really doesn't get affected by P450s. Um, if you're looking at even other commercially available products such as aniline, um, toluene, particularly benzene um, containing molecules, they get metabolized by P450s. In fact, those two molecules I just mentioned are metabolized by this particular one. So what does that tell you about ethanol? Well, it tells you that ethanol, certainly a product that is commercially available in beer, wine, hard liquor, okay, this molecule is treated as a foreign and, and potentially toxic compound, and in fact, in large quantities, it is toxic. We're also going to find out in later videos that its uh, degradation products, which include acetaldehyde and acetate, are also potentially toxic um, to some extent as well, and we'll look at how the body deals with those. But first I want to go over the generic reaction of this by which we can convert ethanol to acetaldehyde. First of all, 
we're going to use a P450. And if you need more information on P450s, I recommend you go back in the playlist or go to the other uh, Cytochrome P450 playlist so you can learn about them. But basically, P450s are not self-sustaining electron transfer enzymes. They require an auxiliary enzyme called cytochrome P450 reductase. And the whole idea with this is cytochrome P450 reductase takes electrons, two of them, from NADPH and transfers one electron sequentially at a time to the P450, and that's going to allow P450, whichever one we're talking about, to perform whatever reaction it's going to do. Okay. And all these P450s, they are users and consumers of molecular oxygen. That's this molecule up here. They're going to consume molecular oxygen, and we're going to get out water, NADP+, the oxidized form of that coenzyme, and then acetaldehyde. And just so for some information right here, this is the ribbon diagram for cytochrome P450, um, 2E1, that is. Um, all these P450s, unless it's a mitochondrial one, this one is not, uh, they are in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And this one is in the smooth ER, and it's, it's a membrane-bound enzyme. Here you can see part of the, um, this is part of the heme cofactor or coenzyme that's here in the active site, and the enzyme P450 is going to use heme to facilitate this reaction. So again, I'm not going to go into the hardcore specifics of P450s, but just for some general information, this right here is the heme coenzyme. Specifically, this one is termed heme B, okay? This is heme B. Um, what you'll notice is that if you take a close look at this, um, each one of these, well, first of all, there's four rings here, um, four five-membered rings. They're der derivatives of pyrrole. And every single one of them is aromatic, and they're all conjugated to each other. So as a result of a completely conjugated slash aromatic ring, this ring is essentially planar. So there's this iron cation, it's in the three plus state in this case, and it's chelated there by the four nitrogens of the heme. Well, the entire ring there is essentially one plane. And it does bend a little bit, but it's essentially one plane. Now, what I'm going to do over here is show you that these are the nitrogens that are contained in the heme ring. And if you essentially view this plane right here, this is, oops, let me redo that. That was a nasty line. If you essentially view this right here as one plane and sort of maybe... This is the x-axis, the y-axis. Then, for the most part, you can consider the porphyrin uh, ring of the heme existing in the x-y plane. And there's four atoms that chelate it in this plane. However, if you move into the, into the z-axis, which goes up and down, then on the bottom, the negative side, on the z-axis, in P450s, you have here the cysteine residue. It's deprotonated, and so it, it's able to interact electrostatically with this iron 3+. Up here, you have a space here that's where the substrate binds. So substrate binding always occurs on the opposite side of the iron that the cysteine residue coordinates the iron from the bottom. One of the functions of the cysteine residue is it's able to, um, it's able to interact with the iron in such a way that it shifts its redox properties to essentially allow oxidation to become a lot easier. And that's one of the functions of having a cysteine here versus the histidine residue that occurs in other enzymes that are not in the P450 superfamily. Okay, but in any case, let's take a look at the mechanism of how this occurs. So this molecule, as we know up here, this is ethanol. And we're gonna look at how the P450 enzyme does this. Now, one thing I wanna point your attention to this thing right here, this is just a shorthand version of um, the important parts of the heme. And so I designated the iron, these lines coming off, those are essentially coordinate covalent bonds to the nitrogens of the heme. I've neglected everything else, though. And one of the things to realize, and I would recommend that you look back in the P450, the complete P450 mechanism, which is in a previous video, in that video, I show how this intermediate in the P450 cycle is generated. But suffice it to say that if you want to get to um, this particular intermediate, there's a few other mechanistic steps that you have to do. Um, those are consistent for pretty much every P450 mechanism that you'll run across. Here we're going to start with how ethanol is converted to acetaldehyde. And remember I said that the cysteine residue that's chelating the iron from the um, axial position on the bottom is able to shift the redox properties of the 
of the enzyme, in particular the heme, so that it's able to do radical chemistry. So what we're going to do here is we're going to have this, one of these bonds right here, and they're coordinate covalent bonds, but they're easily, the electrons are easily transferable. What we're going to do here is we're going to do um, we're going to do a hydrogen abstraction from ethanol. And it's not on the oxygen, it's actually on this carbon right here, right here. So we're going to basically, um, co we're going to basically bond the oxygen and the hydrogen, which forces one of these electrons onto the iron, and it's going to reduce it to the four plus state. Then the other electron from this bond is going to end up on that carbon. And you can see that right here in this um, intermediate. Now what you have is you have this effective hydroxyl group, or this hydroxide, now ketolated to the iron 4 plus. Now what we're going to do is we're going to couple this OH to this radical intermediate over here that was once ethanol. So what's going to happen is we're going to get a coupling here. So one of these electrons from this coordinate covalent bond is going to end up right here. It's going to couple with that radical electron on this intermediate. The other electron from here is going to end up on the iron, and that's going to reduce it to the 3 plus state. As far as we're concerned here, the part of this mechanism that involves heme is complete. But now we have this product right here. This is called a diol. In fact, the name of this molecule is called ethane 1,1 diol. Because if you consider this carbon 1, carbon 2, there's two, out, two hydroxyl groups we call it a diol, and then they're 1,1 one, one with respect to each other because they're on the same carbon. What's going to happen here is we're going to have an internal proton transfer, and then an elimination. So here's what's going to happen. This oxygen right here, the lone pair, is going to attack this proton, and that's essentially going to cause this bond right here to form a carbonyl, and it's going to expel that as the leaving group. Essentially what you're left with is this molecule, which we're able to recognize as acetaldehyde, and then the other thing that comes off, if we put a proton on this oxygen and then it leaves, then the other thing we get off is H2O or water. And that's going to leave us with our final product over here, which is acetaldehyde. And that concludes this video. I hope this mechanism made a little bit of sense. In another video, we're actually going to look at the metabolism of acetaldehyde into acetate. And that's a process that actually occurs in the mitochondria. And then once we do that, we're going to see another mechanism by which we can also produce acetate. Then what do we do with acetate? So I hope this made sense. See you in the next video.